Hey everyone, it's Michael Zapersky and welcome back to another episode of the Consulting Success Podcast. Today, I am joined by Miriam Hadness. Miriam, welcome. Hello. Thank you, Michael. Yes. So Miriam, you are the founder of Workshops Work, uh, where you help individuals and organizations grow their facilitation skills. Um, you have a PhD in behavioral economics. You're the founder of Never Done Before, a community for expert facilitators uh, to help grow their skills. Um which you know is often kind of research and uh, and development departments and so forth, uh, I believe. But I really want to get into a lot of this and uh, have you share your story of how you've built this business. And I think that uh, our listeners will be excited to to learn and will find value in in learning about some of you know your best practices when it comes to facilitation and workshops because. For any consultant, regardless of your industry or where you are in the world, you're probably doing some kind of workshops or some kind of facilitation, even if it's in the form of meetings with uh, with buyers and, and with clients when you get into in, into engagement. So, why don't we start off? <laughs> um, you know, before you started doing what you are doing, I know you. So you're originally from Germany. You're now in in Amsterdam. Um, but what were you doing before you built this business around workshops and facilitation? Mm. I used to be an academic. So yeah. um Are I you worked... a, re a recovering academic? <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, still recovering. <laughs> yeah. And um so I was um teaching economics, then I built a a um a study program in Vietnam for Vietnamese students, then worked in higher education university strategy. I was the strategic advisor to the university professor in Luxembourg. Mm university president in Luxembourg and at some point dropped out because I realized that the public sector is just too small, too political. So I needed something else. I moved to Amsterdam to redesign my life. And I, I tried out different things and came into facilitation basically because I started a meetup through idea parties and couldn't find a job mm. because as an academic with my skill set, I didn't fit into any HR box. And it was through the meetups that then people started to ask me to help them to design workshops to eventually um, facilitate the workshops or to do, pay me for the design without even facilitating them. And so it was really kind of grown from within. And I mm. think what is maybe particular in my Vito, my career, um, my solo career compared to others is that I didn't have my previous consult, uh, my previous employer as my first client. You did not. I did not. Okay. Because I came from academia. I yeah. didn't even know what facilitation was when I started my business. Um, and when I look at most of the consultants around me, they quit their job and their first big client is their former employer. It's very common. Yeah, we did, we did actually a study on this uh, a little while ago at Consulting Success. And um, it was the majority, like it was, I think it was 50 to 60. So I don't remember the exact st uh, statistic, which I may put in the show notes afterwards. But um, yeah, it was quite a few. Like the majority of people, their first client was, it was a previous employer, not necessarily the employer that they just left, but it was one of their previous employers was the most common initial client for most people. Yeah. Yeah. Which makes the jump very easy and quite safe. And I jumped in the, basically off the cliff without knowing what will be there. And then what paid off was that I've always enjoyed networking, even during my academic career. Mm. And so I was lucky enough that my first client basically reached out, I think a few weeks after I actually started officially my business, that they got the budget to have a internal summer school at the European Investment Bank, which is a um, European institution, mm -hmm. um, and hired me as a consultant for that to help them build that up from scratch. Okay, so I have a few questions. The first is you mentioned that you were doing like idea meetups. Idea parties, I call yeah, them. Idea party, yes. yeah. So what, what is an yeah. idea party? Um, I basically made that up. I think in today's language, I would call it a mastermind. 
So I invited people to come with the challenge. Mm. And then with a group of, I think we were 20 or so, we brainstormed solutions. Mm. And I had my very particular kind of um, design on how to go about this brainstorming. And then the promise was that they would leave with ideas, solutions, and new friends. And were you charging for this or was it free? Um, I charged, I think, five. The initial ones were free, and then I charged maybe five euros. Okay. Um, and I never made a sense out of it. Right. And I eventually actually called it a mastermind and had the brilliant idea of do a um, pay as you want. Mm. <laughs> and then realized that for a mastermind, you get what you pay for. Right. So if you're charging little, then yeah. the quality that is generated is sure. very little. If you charge a lot, then everyone will be happy because yeah. it well, attracts the right people. It's like most things in, in pricing, right? Even beyond masterminds that not only uh, is it true like for, for you, right? So if you charge a, a higher fee, let's say a lower fee, you're going to typically get people that are um, not as high caliber, right? And that's partly because their mindset is, they're not seeing the big picture, but it's also... A negative for for the client because if they've invested less they tend to be less invested right into achieving an outcome or result because if they don't take action they don't have as much to lose whereas if they've invested let's say ten thousand dollars into being part of a mastermind or in some cases it could be i mean there's masterminds that are a hundred thousand dollars per year it's like well you, you know you're gonna definitely make sure that you take big action because you want to achieve the result right otherwise it wouldn't make sense so i think that's a very yes. interesting perspective to uh that you're sharing yeah, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Totally. Also, if you invested so much money, then you want to tell yourself that you made the right investment decision. Yeah. So you, as you say, you will put in more effort in order to make it work. And you will share with more people how successful this was, including mm -hmm. yourself. Right. Just to keep the self-image right. Okay. And so that's the idea party. Um, and yeah. then where do you get the people like how are you inviting these people was this just like on meetup.com or what were you yeah okay so you just kind of put it out there on, yeah mostly on meetup.com and then i was part of a co-working space so i told the people in the co-working space and they invited their friends right so it was very grassroots and then you mentioned that you you had kind of your own like framework or approach to how you wanted to conduct this this idea party um where did that come from? Like mm. with that knowledge of how to actually structure that kind of an event or a gathering to make it productive? Yeah. So I have, um, my background is in behavioral economics. So I have um, for my PhD run experiments to basically measure um, how humans take decisions and nudge them to take better decisions. So I have observed many people on how we go about um, communicating with each other, but also, as I was always interested in communication, how we give advice. Mm. And for instance, the first the first activity that I always did was a brainstorm on questions instead of ideas. Because we always get defensive if someone throws ideas at us, especially if they don't have enough context about what the problem is about. Mm. So if I invite people to come with a challenge and to pitch their challenge in two minutes, how good will the ideas be by people, as you said, who paid five euros to join this idea party? But by asking them, okay, what are the questions that come to your mind listening to these challenges, then you have all the different perspectives and basically the person who brings in the challenge mm. goes back with an abundance of new perspectives and angles that they can look for a solution within themselves. Right. Uh, so that reminds me of uh, Liz Wiseman in the book of the multipliers talks about this concept of the best leaders ask uh, really great questions, right? So as a leader, it's very, typically you want to just like, you want to give the direction and say, do this because you know, or, or you th you believe that you know, but the best leaders tend to focus on uh, ways to kind of get questions out of their team. So I love that that's what you're, it sounds like you're doing is you're starting off by rather than just giving people ideas, you're really focusing on help people to ask the questions that are making them think. And they're probably because of that, they're able to, to see bigger opportunities or more expansive opportunities or a more expansive landscape. Uh, but it, I would also imagine they're almost priming themselves subconsciously 
to be more open to the ideas that are going to flow out from that discussion. Is that correct? Absolutely. And especially because it it empowers them to find their own solutions. Because if they find an answer to the question, and they didn't answer the questions on the spot. Right. So it was basically a gift, little gift package for them to go back with these questions. And I think, I love what you're saying about the leaders asking questions. And I have the impression that many get the idea of the value of asking questions wrong, which sounds terrible. But I think that um, if we're asking questions that could have been a Google search, we're wasting everyone's time mm. because do the Google search. Yeah. But when we come together in real time where we are sharing our most important resources, which is attention um, and time, yeah. then let's ask questions where we're actually interested in someone's perspective. Yeah. And then we want to generate these, ah, mm, these moments of wonder, of curiosity. Th and that's this, what questions are for. Yeah, I mean, this makes me think like uh, of the connection to what's happening in the world right now with with artificial intelligence, right? AI and everybody talking about AI and ChatGPT and now Google Bard and like all this, these different kind of technologies and tools. Um, but I, but my my what I'm seeing right now, and I could be completely wrong, but my perspective and observation is that one thing that AI currently is not going to replace is strategic thinking or mm -hmm. creative thinking. And so even though you can you can probably pull out and extract questions from chat GPT or whatever the AI mm -hmm. is, you're probably not gonna be able to extract the kind of thoughtful questions that somebody who's really being thoughtful and thinking deeply, thinking strategically, thinking creatively. And so that's, that's the value that let's say a facilitator or a workshop or really any consultant brings to their clients, right? So clients that are concerned about AI taking away, uh, or so I should say, yeah, consultants that are concerned about AI taking away their job, I mean, it'll might take off some roles of what you do, mm. but the real value that you can add is not going to be taken away because that comes from the strategic or creative thinking that AI right now in its current form, certainly I don't believe can, can do. What, what are your thoughts on, on that? Um, oh, this can become a very long tangent <laughs> and I love it. I, um, I agree that AI can help us in strategic thinking. Um, I, or cannot help us in strategic thinking. I do believe that the AI powered assistants are highly creative. Mm. When you ask about 20 different ideas, let them do the brainstorm. Right. But then let's do the, the part where, okay, so what are we doing with these ideas? How can we bring them to the next level? And then it becomes interesting. Yeah. Right. And I, um, what I find sad that some see AI or ChatGPT as a competitor, I think we need to learn to collaborate with them mm. because they have, I think it's, we learn to better communicate and to be very precise because if we are asking a question that's not precise enough to ChatGPT, we don't get anything of value. Mm -hmm. So we can actually learn to be better communicators through collaborating with AI because when I when I ask a friend or a coworker, a colleague, a question, and I get an answer that is not satisfactory, I get frustrated. Ah, oh, you don't understand me. Mm -hmm. When I don't get the right answer from ChatGPT, I don't get frustrated. I realize, oh, I wasn't precise enough. Mm -hmm. Imagine how we can grow our own self-awareness that we're asking the wrong questions because we trained our question asking skills with yeah. ChatGPT. I really like, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of, um, it's a new lens on, on how to look at it. Right. So rather than viewing that it is being negative or positive or whatever, it sounds like you're really taking the approach of where you understand what the limitations are, but at the same time, you're, you're open to the benefits and possibilities of it and really finding ways to harness those inside of your business or, as you said, even inside of communication in a more general uh, way. Yeah. And what I um, also see that the ben if you don't know anything, ChatGPT can be very dangerous to use because it invents information. Mm -hmm. So you can ask, I asked ChatGPT, write me a workshop plan for a 90 minutes workshop about communication, about asking questions. Mm -hmm. 
fantastic. But then if you add up the times, it doesn't add up to 90 minutes. Right. And if you look closer to it, you're like, ah, oh, maybe you cannot start with this warm up because you first need to create the safe space, for instance. Sure, sure. But it's a wonderful start for me then to say, okay, I can work with that. And I know that I have first to create the the yeah. safe space and that maybe I need to adjust the timings. Right. So I think if you know a lot, then you can really enhance and 10x your productivity with ChatGPT mm -hmm. um, and even creativity because it will give you ideas that you have never considered. Yes. If you don't know anything, then it's very dangerous because you will start posting stuff that the wheel experts identify very quickly as not yeah. so true. Well, so you were definitely right that it's easy for us to go down a, a bit of a rabbit hole and tangent on, on AI conversations, but I want to bring it back to focusing on, on you, Miriam, and how you, you build this business. So you mentioned that the first client really came from doing these, these meetups, right? These kind of idea parties, somebody then recognized like, Hey, you seem to have a skill around mm -hmm. facilitation workshops. We now have some funding. Can you, can you help us? Mm -hmm. um, fast forward from that point. How did you start getting more business coming in to the point where you felt, hey, I now have a business where I'm helping people with facilitation and workshops? Mm. I think the wheel accelerator came through the podcast. And how, how, and how long ago was that? So give me the year. When did you, when did you start 2019, the podcast? April 2019. We are now April. No, we're May 2023. Yep. Um, and it's precisely 216 weeks ago, I guess. Right, because you know the episode, the episode number, yeah. Yeah, um, so it's and, an episode how, per week. How quickly from the time that you started the podcast, uh, and not even how quickly, just at, at what point, What point? like how far time or number of episodes in were you when you went, huh, this is actually starting to help me with the business? Mm. So I was speaking to avoid, I think, for 30 weeks, for 30 episodes. Okay. And then suddenly I got... I think somewhere between 25 and 30, I got the first call or a message on LinkedIn. Miriam, you've been in my ear all the time. You're exactly whom we need. Mm. And was this was an organization? This was a big organization and they wanted to have a, they basically invited all of their sales um salespeople from around the globe yeah. to come to the headquarters and they wanted a conference that is rather a workshop right so all the previous years they had it they had speakers talking to all these mm -hmm. sales people but now the um, the organization went through a transformation so they wanted to be more my agile wanted to be more uh, collaborative right. so they thought that what they need is actually a workshop approach yeah and instead of hiring me to design the conference for them they hired me to enable their team to design the conference so 30 weeks i mean you know we're, we're getting it's almost like a year of uh speaking to as you said the void or not really seeing any fruits of of your labors um to some people that would seem like insanity you know the fact mm -hmm. that you, you keep going when nothing is working uh they would look at it and say you know i've, I've tried it like i've done it for you know, not only a couple months, it's now been several months and I'm just, I'm like not getting results. Um, I'm spending this time, this money, maybe this doesn't work for me in my industry, in my business, in my load, like, you know, all these, this talk in the, in like yeah. this mental chatter, mm -hmm. um, you kept going. So yeah. why did you keep going? Mm. I think, I don't know how it's for you, but for me, you don't start a podcast because you think that it will be quick conversion, quick cash. Yeah. There is um, there's a deep passion and there's curiosity. Yeah. And to be honest, when I started the podcast, I thought, so the podcast called Workshops Work, I interview facilitators. I thought initially that after 20 episodes, I'm done. I mean, how many conversations can you have about facilitation and workshops? Right? <laughs> well, it's like me, how many, how many conversations can I have with consultants? And, yeah. you know, here we are, yeah, 300 whatever episodes in. And um, yeah, I feel the same way. So exactly. So the, the beauty of it is, um, and I couldn't 
see it back then is I built a network of facilitators expert around the globe. So now I'm working rather as an agency. So if companies come to me and say, okay, we need workshops on the topic of psychological safety. Mm -hmm. And we have a global, um, our employees work globally. So we need to deploy these workshops, these trainings in 15 different languages at different time zones. And it needs to be always the same quality, always the same warmth. I can provide that. You can do that. And so that came as a result of doing the podcast because you were interviewing the people that uh, would become these, well, they were already facilitators. Associates. Yeah, yeah, associates. Okay, so, and was that the intention? Like, did you kind of see that? As, so, okay, so there's no strategy. It just, that was yeah. kind of an organic, as you did it, you started to realize, hey, this is an opportunity. And the so the funny thing is, I thought... So I started the podcast initially because I thought it's a marketing strategy, not necessarily for me, but for the professional facilitators. Mm -hmm. Because every time I pitched myself as, oh, I'm a facilitator, people would go like, oh, you're a consultant. I'm like, "Uh, no, I'm a facilitator. I facilitate workshops. And people would go, oh, workshops. Is someone still doing that? (laughs) So I was there. What's what's the stigma? Or why would somebody respond like, huh, workshop, what's... What's the where, the where the kumbaya people who sit in a circle ask you how you're feeling and throw around sticky notes, and then oh, the next okay. day everyone wakes up like with a hangover. Nobody remembers what has happened, and nobody wants to clean up the mess. Yeah, I think I must be going to to better workshops because that's when I hear the word workshop. To me, it feels like very productive, an experience, mm-hmm. an outcome, a result. Um, you know, like something you kind of like really get your hands. In so uh, it's interesting that stigma exists. I'm certainly not part of that crowd, but uh, Taki, like, you, I think there, <laughs> I think there, honestly, there are people that are traumatized from bad workshops, right. Um, right? And then, so there is an there's an art in the craft um, yeah. of really designing these experiences. So I thought, okay, let's launch a podcast to show the world what facilitation can do and what it means to be a facilitator. Mm. Got it. And so I thought that I will then attract these clients so that I can host workshops for them. What I then realized, I think a hundred episodes in was, wait a moment, I am celebrating my podcast guests. These are my heroes. And how can it be true that I am promoting them, giving them a stage and at the same time kind of competing And it didn't sit right. Mm. And it was about then, then suddenly I started building a community of facilitator that was never done before. So what is the playground where actually experienced facilitators can test their new ideas? Mm -hmm. That's why it's the research and development department. And then through this community, which is global, I think we have over 40 countries in the community. Now it becomes the interconnection with the agency and the community with the podcast guests, suddenly it becomes one big ecosystem. Yeah. I, I love that. I mean, what, what's so powerful to me. So as you said, you spent, you know, 30, was it 30 or so episodes of mm-hmm. doing this, right? So multiple months in and before I was saying, you know, almost a year. So it wasn't a year. It was, you know, uh, a little year. over half a year. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, but still like that's, it's, it's, it's time putting into this week, week in, week out, but what you've created today would not, I'm guessing, would not have happened if you mm. did not do the podcast, right? Like, and so sometimes you don't know what's going to actually occur unless you try it, uh, right? So just taking the step, taking the action created the opportunity where that opportunity likely wouldn't have come if you wouldn't have actually just started it and, and yeah. continued going. Totally, totally. Yeah. And I think the podcast is, is on the one hand, it's also education for myself. Everything I know about facilitation, I know from my podcast guests. Mm. If someone would listen to the 215 episodes, they would know as much as I do. Mm. And I think the the podcast is, and you might recognize that, you can have a copywriter, you cannot have a copy speaker. Mm. So what you speak on the podcast, that's 100% you. You cannot be more authentic. And I do long form so my my interviews are usually one and a half hours long. Cannot fake it. Yeah. It's yeah. as much as me as they can get. 
Right. And I think um, it's it's a nice way to really build relationships. And um, I heard someone say that podcasting is caring at scale. Mm, interesting. Like yeah. yeah. So let, let's go back. To the, so the, the podcast was kind of that initial driver of starting to get more business coming in. Uh, let's now kind of, again, fast forward to, to today. What's what's working? Um, how are you generating leads? How are people finding out, out mm-hmm. about the business currently? Yeah. I think it's mostly still the podcast. Okay. And I have, um, I have an entire machinery behind the podcast. So I have... Um, obviously an editor, but then I have a copywriter who would repurpose um, the nuggets. I, for every episode, I write a one page summary. Yeah. So I really do care at scale. Um, I think my weekly newsletter has opening rates of 60%. Wow. That's phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. So people read the newsletter. And what's Um, inside the newsletter? It's the one page summary. It's usually one part is just a thought of the week that I had um, mm-hmm. reflecting on something that has usually to do with either leadership facilitation um, or personal development. Yeah. And then it's a summary of the podcast um, and the one page summary. Mm. Love it. Um, all right. So, and, and these people, you mentioned you have the, like an editor for the podcast, you have a copywriter. Um, are these then people, the summary. yeah. Yeah. Are, are they full-time? Are they contractors? What is that? They're like? contractors. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. So I, um, I work with contractors. I have a team of six, I think, in total. Yeah. Um, and you're, and, and you're, the, you're managing all that? Like you're the central hub for all those yeah. six contractors? Yeah. Okay. And I think thinking of the moment when I could make the jump to just struggling as a freelancer to really generate some income and to make it fun actually Mm. to run a business and then eventually transform into a limited company was um, hiring a virtual assistant before I was actually able to afford her. Mm. So tell me about that. Like what, number one, I guess two questions. What is the first thing that you, you got her to do? Like what, why did you actually bring on that virtual assistant? And then I'd love to just kind of put a pin in this, but come back to it. Why, why did you then make that leap to actually hire a, a VA before mm. you felt that you could afford it? It was for all the repetitive tasks. So all the back end, upload the new episode, create a landing page, yeah. um, all these kind of things. And and also I was um that was the year in the pandemic I was hosting my first festival for the never done before community. Mm. So there was a lot of back and forth and tech stuff in the background. Right. And I realized that if I spend all the time with the nitty gritty that is actually repetitive or very time consuming, sure. I don't have it's not even that I don't have time to generate leads, but I don't have time to generate thoughts. That will mm-hmm. generate leads. Yeah. I mean, so one way of looking at, at that, um, I don't know who who is the person that says this, but it's always resonated with me, is that when you are building a team, whether it's like a, a VA or, you know, part-time freelancer, full-time, what you're, you're not, there's two parts to it. The first is that you're, you're getting somebody to help you with something. And usually that's going to be something that is maybe lower value work for you, which means you get to focus on higher value work. But the other area that most people don't pay attention to, but in my mind is so critical is that you're, you're buying back your time, yes. right? And so like, that's the one asset none of us gets to create, you know, create more or new time, but here by doing that, you're actually creating and buying, buying time. And so that's a very valuable investment, but let's come to like where, where you were, because at that moment you didn't feel like you were in a financial place to be able to afford that, but you still did it. So how did you justify that in, in your mind and kind of take that leap? And I think this is uh, the mental the mental piece to it is, yes, you're pi- buying back time, but also you're, I gave myself the clear signal that I will be able to afford it and that's worth my time. Mm. So you, you, were, and, you were operating not based on where you were, it sounds like in making a decision. Will be. Yeah. So you're thinking, well, this is the person I want to become. Therefore, I need to operate and make decisions based on who I want to be, not who I am today. 
Yeah. And I think that's when looking at consultants and those who want to become um, higher paid consultants, I think that's also how we have to speak with our clients. Mm -hmm. It's if they would pay just what they can already afford, then they will stay in whatever place they are. Yeah. But if they want to make the big jump, then also to come back to what you said earlier, it's only when you when you invest the money that you will then also put them the work in to make yeah. it happen. So by hiring the VA, getting out of my comfort zone, making a financial stretch, I knew that now I have to make the money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. that I have the capabilities to make that money. It's the concept. Um, I remember many years ago learning of this idea of like being being a mirror, right? So mm -hmm. if if you want to attract clients that are willing to invest at high levels with you, you know, pay premium fees, then you yourself need to do that. So you, you can't be the kind of person that goes around trying to skimp, you know, on every little thing and go, oh yeah, I know I need this coaching. I know I need the support, but I'm, I'm going to put it off, you know, X number of months <laughs> until X perfection, you know, stars align. Like you, you can't operate from that place. If you yourself want to then meet clients who you want to, to you know, when you meet them, they say, yeah, let's move forward and let's do it. I'm okay to pay these high fees. So you need to act the way that you want others to act. You need to kind of mirror, you know, your, uh, your behavior in the way that you want others to also, because it's this, it, it tends like that, that energy attracts and you tend to, yeah. um, connect more with those that you are operating at the same level. Right. So if you're surrounding yourself with successful people, like you're going to tend to become more successful yourself just by being part of that community. If you're surrounding yourself with people who aren't thinking about business, not talking about business, uh, and they're they're always just you know negative, or they're not really taking action, or they're holding their potential back. It's unlikely that you're going to be you know successful and break break through, or it makes it a lot more challenging to do so. Totally, isn't there? I think there's so much truth to the saying that you become the average of the five people you spend most time with. Yeah, I think Jim Rohn said that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it is because of the mirroring. And I think it's just um, very inherent human behavior that we do mirror people and adjust to their behavior and thinking to um, for bonding. Yeah. That's how um, survival strategy. Sure. So, so we have to become the average of the five people. And I think if we don't, if it doesn't feel scary to start working with a coach, then it's the one coach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I agree. And so I, I think about this and, you know, my first thought was about the different people that we've spoken to over the years. And sometimes, um, like, you know, we know that they need the help and they know they need the help. Otherwise, like, why would they be on a call? Why would they be even exploring it? And then the reason that sometimes people don't move forward is because of the exact same reason they reached out. It's like, they know they need the help. They know that they've been delaying, making a decision, hesitating, and then they do it all over again, right? Like they just keep hesitating. And so I think about all, you know, all the years that we've invested into our own coaches and mentors and programs and, and all that. And in many cases, you know, it's a pretty significant investments that, that we're making. And you could look at it and go like, wow, that's a lot of money. Maybe, you know, we should hold off our way to try and do something cheaper. But at the same time, it's like, well, do you want to stay where you are? Or do you want to level up and get to that next place? And the way to do that is by learning from those that have already done that and where you can get new ideas, new perspectives to help you to see bigger and to then take, take bigger action, or in many cases, more, more effective action. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a, it's a mindset you need to nurture and you need to grow in. And I think thinking back of my very early days, when I just started my business, I think I had the most impressive looking website mm -hmm. and I didn't even know what to sell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I spent so much money on designers to yes. create this amazing website. Right. And I think I was, and I invested in a coach and at some point had to break up with him because he was pushing me into developing funnels and all that stuff and, and pricing and putting with it. I don't even know what I'm selling. Yeah. Yeah. But then when the first client called, I could send them to a website. They looked at it and it looked as if I was air quotes professional enough mm -hmm. for them to hire me. And then they believed that they would get the quality. And after they got it, then it becomes a word of mouth business. Yeah. 
So I want to talk to you about um, workshops in a little more more detail because again, consultants in whatever format you know they're they're delivering their expertise, whatever their industry and specialization and so forth. Um, there's an element of workshops that they are probably bringing, like, even if they don't offer quote unquote workshops as a service or as an offering, they're likely holding a workshop or, or facilitating some kind of a meeting or an experience with clients. And so I, I want to cover two parts. The first is what are the most common kind of biggest mistakes that you see people making when it comes to workshops? Um, and I'm sure you've seen them over and over again. So what tends to come up? And then the second is what's the secret sauce or what's the best practice to running uh, a, just a highly successful, impactful workshop? Mm. The biggest mistakes, I think, start with I think trying to be someone that you're not. Mm, what do you mean by that? That um, if, especially in the, if you're wearing the hat of a consultant and you're there basically to run a workshop because you need some outcome, some input, then it's very easy to think that, oh, I, I'm the consultant. I know it all. So I have to come across as super professional. Mm. And then very often you become stiff. And if you are tense and stiff and try to be someone who you are not, mirroring everyone on the other side of the table or the screen will also be stiff and have the impression that they are not good enough. Mm. Although I think the magic of a workshop um, comes from the fact that everyone feels um, valuable and the best version of themselves in order to contribute and to grow bigger than right. its parts so how, how do people do that so let's say okay that makes sense um people that are joining us can can see that as well what are the steps that they can take to to you know be more natural be themselves yeah. and and get those that are in the room with them whether virtual or or you know real real life physical um to to feel awesome. valuable and to feel yeah part of of that experience yeah so i think the first step is to to acknowledge that as soon as you step into a workshop, which is not a training, it's a workshop, you acknowledge that all the wisdom is in the room already. Mm. So, so does, it, does that mean actually you tell the people in the room? Like, do you say that to them? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because they are there for a very specific reason. So actually a successful workshop starts even before the workshop starts. So you need to have a purpose. Why are we having this? Mm -hmm. So everyone, you're expecting people to invest their two most important resources, time and attention. Mm -hmm. Why? Why can't we do this asynchronously? Or why can't it be an email? Mm -hmm. It's not an email because we need the perspectives and input from everyone who's in there. So why is everyone there? Everyone needs a role. If someone is there just to oh, let me just be the fly on the wall and I just observe or, oh, I don't have time. I just um, come in the first 10 minutes and then I disappear. Doesn't work because mm. it will send the signal to the others that it's not important enough. Right. And whoever doesn't have a role, then they very quickly become um, disruptors. They will be the ones who say, but we've been discussing this for 15 years already. Why do we have to come up with this again? Of course, if they don't know why they are there, they don't know why we're discussing this again. Right. Okay. Um, so it's very important to be um, clear about who is there and why. And very often we get into the, we step into the trap that we over invite. Oh, if we invite Peter, then we also need to invite Sarah. And if we're inviting Sarah, then how, how will Michael look at me? And then suddenly you have all these people there. Um, and they don't know what they're doing there. Mm. And then they won't engage. So let, let me ask you a question related to that. Um, let's say that a consultant is uh, running a workshop or facilitating some kind of a, a, a meeting that is really critical to the success of an initiative or a project. And the CEO uh, is going to play a key role. Like the consultant knows that. But for whatever reason, the CEO has delegated this to others, you know, in, in management, um, mm. 
when that happens, what should the consultant do? Um, if the consultant knows the CEO needs to be part of this conversation, uh, but they're not, they've delegated it. Have you ever seen that kind of situation? And, and if so, what's the best way in your experience to, to make sure that you do have the right people in the room? And I guess the second part of that question, if I can add is, uh, where maybe the company's saying, let's bring in these other people, but you as the facilitator or the consultant, the advisor, know that those people should not be in the room for whatever reason. Mm. How do you handle those two situations? Mm, so with the CEO who doesn't have time, I think it's um, it depends who the sponsor is. If the CEO is the sponsor of the workshop and they have an interest in the outcome, they have to be there. Mm -hmm. Unless... Sometimes it can actually be valuable not to have the sponsor, the CEO in the room, because you want to avoid the, avoid the leadership bias. Mm -hmm. So, and then it's important to phrase it and maybe he or she can come in the first 10 minutes to say, okay, this is really important to me and I will not be here for these reasons. I want you to be creative or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I come back for the last 10 minutes to right. listen to what you have created. Mm. So at least to give it some framing Sure. And I think there are many reasons why it's very often actually good not to have the CEO in the room. And if they are there, I very often like to give them actually the task of be the air quotes fly in the wall to observe and ask questions and listen instead of speak too much. Right. And then summarize what they have heard and picked up from the conversation. And this has such a beautiful impact because then... Mm the people feel heard, appreciate it, and CEOs usually are right. fast thinkers, yeah. so that they can level it up. If they delegate it to people who then delegate it and then invite people who shouldn't be there, um, I have told clients that um, this is not possible, that we cannot invite them. Um, what I usually do, especially for these high stakes workshops, is I have calls conversations with everyone who will be in the space before this, before the before, workshop yeah mm -hmm. okay doesn't need to be long can be 15 minutes right what is good is i clarify they know i clarify with them what their role will be if they don't know and i don't understand we think together whether it actually makes sense for them to be there mm -hmm. and if they want to be there um then it's on us to right. figure out what will be the role. How can they contribute actively? Because right. even if someone is, oh, it's just my assistant, um, he will just take notes, but otherwise not participate. No, we have AI for that. We'll record. Um, if it's an assistant, um, what perspective can he bring in mm -hmm. that we are otherwise missing? Right. Someone who knows the back end, someone who yeah. knows the gossip, super valuable. Right. So you're really making sure that if whoever is in that room has a very clear kind of role and purpose or some value um, yeah. that they can add. What about the situation where, and I think many consultants have encountered this, where there's somebody that is part of the communication chain or part of, you know, they're in the room and they tend to be toxic or negative mm -hmm. or, you know, they're a detractor. Um, they're not, they're not really adding, adding value. Uh, how do you handle that? How do you recommend that people kind of navigate that situation? So there, um, there are different parts to that. I think that nobody is intrinsically toxic or wants to be a distractor. It's usually because they don't know why they're there. Mm. They don't feel heard or they felt overstepped or something. So something has triggered them so that they have the urge to over contribute right. in whatever shape or form. So this can be, I think the best strategy is to avoid that by having the conversations beforehand. Mm -hmm. And actually, if if I get the sense that there is someone who knows it all, right, there always a knows it all. And then if I know that this person is there, how can I give them a role to actually use it? Oh, Sarah, I know exactly that you have a hundred ideas on this topic already because you have thought about that so swiftly so i ask you to hold back for a minute and let the other speak first and then i'm sure that you can add something that we haven't thought about right so you're thinking about based on the interaction with them if it seems like they might be 
they might dominate or they might add negativity. You're going to try and kind of position them or work with them uh, and almost like guide them so that they're less likely to, to, to act in that way, but they're still going to be able to add some value and to contribute. Yeah. So I think the, the challenge is to find the silver lining of these kind of behaviors mm -hmm. and see how can they actually contribute another perspective. Right. Okay. And, uh, yeah. and I think yeah. also what um, many non-facilitators, an option that um, is underused are breakout rooms. So even, so even when we sit all around one table, we never have a conversation with more than four people. Mm. If there are more than four people around the table, it's either one person speaking and everyone listening, or it's a conversation between two or three. Right. And then what happens are usually side conversations. Mm -hmm. um, and then people start whispering or exchanging glances. Right. Online, it's the same, with the only exception that we cannot have side conversations. So how can we help everyone to contribute if there's no space um, for all these people, break them up, say, okay, mm -hmm. take four minutes, five minutes, discuss in a one-on-one -on -one or in a group of three, and then come back and share. Yeah. And people I, feel safer in a smaller group. I love these tips around, um, I mean, just it's very, the, the process is very thoughtful. I love the, the idea of having these conversations, these calls in advance to really set the stage to make the workshop or meeting itself significantly more, more effective likely also more kind of efficient uh, and, and productive. I want to get your your thoughts on pricing for a moment. Uh, people often wonder, you know, what does the market bear when it comes to workshops? Um, and so, again, I have two parts to this, I guess, this question that's coming to my mind right now. And the first is, if we just look at workshops by itself, What's the range that you've seen, you know, and I know there's a lot of kind of variables and factors and, and I, I welcome you to share with me what some of those more common variables and factors are, but <clears throat> yeah, what is the range? Like what's the high end of a workshop that you've seen? Um, and then what's the, the lower kind of entry, you know, starting point for a workshop from a pricing perspective? It depends on so many factors. So if you have a room full of, um, if you have a C-suit, C-suite in a workshop strategy offsite, um, then obviously you have to price it in the 10,000s. Mm -hmm. Also to coming back to what you said, how much time would they use preparing this workshop right. if it's peanuts, then right. it won't be worth their time. So is that like one, one day, 10, 20, 30,000, something like that? Or yeah, things? maybe a day... To, 10,000. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and if someone is focused on delivering workshops, if, if that's like, let's say a core offer for them, what have you seen people do? Or what do you suggest that people do if let's say they want to earn more than $10,000 per engagement? Mm. I th and I must be clear. So the 10,000 per engagement, um, that's the upper range, I would say yeah. for strategy workshops. And then it depends on I think focus on the value instead of nobody buys a workshop. Right. <laughs> There's no client who comes to you and says, I want a workshop. No, they, yeah. they want you to solve a problem and they want you to solve the problem with their resources. Mm -hmm. Otherwise they would hire a consultant. Right? So a facilitator doesn't come with a, with a solution. They come with the process and with the questions that mm -hmm. help their people solve the problem. Right. So, I think then starting with what is the cost of not having the workshop? So if, for instance, there is um, they need a strategy workshop because um, they need to increase sales. What mm -hmm. if they don't solve this problem and bankruptcy or um, they have a talent problem and they need to attract more talent. So what is the real value to solve this problem? Mm -hmm. Um, and how much of this could yeah. they, yeah. Totally. I mean, that, that's, Invest. that's exactly the guidance that we, you know, we work with clients through in terms of, of pricing. It's no, yeah, nobody wakes up saying, yeah, like I, I want to buy a strategic planning session or this deliverable, or, you know, it's, it's the outcome, it's the result, it's the value. 
to be created. And then just to make the distinction for those that, that may not be clear yet, how do you view the difference between a workshop and a training? Mm -hmm. um, for a training, you can facilitate a training. But I think in general, a trainer comes in to bridge a knowledge gap. So the group needs knowledge that they don't have yet. Mm -hmm. So they're hiring a trainer who hopefully uses facilitation in their method right. to help them learn these skills. Right. A facilitator comes in with the belief that all the knowledge is in the room already. Mm -hmm. So the the number of people who are sitting there have everything they need, but they're lacking the vehicle to actually really bring that out and put the pieces of the puzzle together. Yeah, um, I love that. It's a, it's a very clear way to kind of see the the difference between those two things. So um, Miriam, there's there's so much more that we could keep talking about and, and going over here. I wanna respect the time that we have um, in the calendar, but I wanna also make sure that people can learn more about you, about your work, about your podcast, about um, your community for facilitators and just everything else that you have going on. So where should people go? Where's where's the the best place, the one maybe you know website that they should go to um, or destination to find out more about you and everything else that you have going on? I think the easiest way is LinkedIn. Okay. I'm an open book on LinkedIn and from there they'll find me and find their way on my on my newsletter. Okay, there we go. They, yeah, they get 60 plus percent open rates, which is um, I mean, it's, I wouldn't, unheard of is not an accurate term, but it's, it's so far above the standard, um, that I think that yeah, definitely people need to check that out. Uh, I'm interested in checking it out. Cause I want to see, you know, what's, what's the goodness that you got in there. That's, it's, uh, the magic, right. Um, so Miriam, we will link that up. We'll have your, your LinkedIn profile in the show notes and people can obviously, uh, find you as well. Um, just by going to LinkedIn, uh, I want to thank you so much for coming on here today uh, sharing just, you know, a, a bit of your journey. I know there's so much more that we could, uh, dig into, uh, but I, I appreciate yeah, what you've, you've shared so far and, um, and just was really enjoyed the conversation. So thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for the invite, Michael. Pleasure.